I call the first witness, Irene Khan, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Freedom of Expression. Irene is with us today virtually. Thank you, Irene. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Um, would you uh, like me to? Didn't, uh, no, just absolutely. Hello and welcome. And, and I just wanted to present a very initial question. If you could please introduce yourself for the tribunal and the audience. Thank you. Uh, I'm Irene Khan. I was appointed by the UN Human Rights Council in August 2020 to be the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Opinion and Expression. A Special Rapporteur in the UN system is an independent uh, expert uh, with the uh, mandate to monitor, advise and publicly report on the state of human rights uh, relating to that mandate. And prior to assuming this appointment, I was Director General of the International Development Law Organization from 2012 to 2019, and prior to that, Secretary General of Amnesty International from 2001 to 2009, and I have a background in refugee law, international human rights law. I'm currently teaching uh, human rights law at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Thank you. Um, I was, was, we were hoping if from your experience now as a special rapporteur, you could describe in your perspective, and you know, it's an invaluable uh, perspective about the impunity around uh, the, the crimes committed against journalists, but specifically what issues you could identify that makes this impunity perhaps so, so rampant and so deep? Thank you. Um, let me start by saying that impunity is a critical problem in relation to the safety of journalists, but also in relation to the independence, diversity, and pluralism of media. Media freedom is uh, threatened by the continued impunity to address crimes against journalists. The needle effectively has not moved in the last 15 years since uh, statistics have been, uh, UNESCO has been gathering statistics on this issue. Uh, and the facts and the numbers, of course, speak for themselves. Between 2006 and today, uh, around 1,480 uh, journalists uh, have been killed. That means roughly a journalist killed every four days over the past uh, years. And the highest numbers have occurred in Latin America, um, representing 31% and very close to it uh, in the Asia Pacific region with 30% of the killings. And they appear uh, to happen both in countries in times of war as well as in peace, particularly linked uh, to investigative uh, journalism of organized crime, corruption, abuse of power, and in particular, the nexus between business and politicians. Let me also mention that we, while we, of course, uh, focus on killings of uh, journalists here, and killings, of course, attract the most uh, public attention, um, there are also other forms of attacks that take place. In fact, UNESCO reports show that increasingly, as the number of killings go down, the numbers of arbitrary detention has been going up, and there are all forms of other harassment, kidnapping, torture, abduction, even judicial harassment, uh, as is well known in the case of Maria Ressa, who received the Nobel uh, Peace Prize this year. Um, so there is, on the one hand, a continued intensified attacks on journalists, and on the other hand, uh, very little has changed in terms of impunity. Nine out of 10 cases of per the perpetrators go unpunished. And here it is important to point out, as I said earlier, that we see uh, the same level, uh, if not higher, sometimes higher levels of killings in peacetime. They are inevitably linked to the nexus between politics and business. And that implicates state officials uh, and, of course, uh, provides uh, the explanation for this high level of impunity in the case of uh, journalists uh, being killed. The killing of a journalist, of course, violates many human rights relating to the individual uh, himself or herself. Uh, but it also has a chilling effect on media freedom. It silences others and it is it affects the right of society to know. It is both freedom of expression is an individual right, but it is also uh, very heavily related to, to the society's right 
uh, to enjoy uh, media freedom. So I think the impact is enormous and, and very significant of uh, this continued high level of impunity. Irene, that actually introduces my next question greatly, which is exactly that. Have we reached the point precisely for the quality of the impunity, but also the impact and the more pernicious effects across societies where an international mechanism, I mean, we know that the, the high panel exists and UNESCO, you mentioned, and obviously your, your own um, post, but have there's any international mechanisms in addition on a more permanent way being considered to fight this impunity or address it? Well, of course, as you know, uh, the first uh, port of call for justice is the national system. But where the national system fails, there are examples in international law um, of international mechanisms being created. There is, of course, right now the International Criminal Court and the killing of a, of a journalist uh, in, in certain conditions can amount to a war crime and that mechanism could come into play. There are also a whole range of other international accountability mechanisms uh, within the framework of the UN to counter impunity. For example, UN mandated commissions of inquiry, fact-finding missions, investigations, uh, and we've seen them, for example, operate uh, in, in uh, Syria and uh, in other war on Libya, there were the, the group of eminent persons on Yemen, as you know, whose mandate uh, was not renewed. So there are many uh, possibilities down that path. There is, of course, the special rapporteurs, my mandate, for example, or the UN treaty bodies to whom complaints can be brought. But we do not do criminal investigations. We do human rights invest investigations. So there are some limits to it. Uh, the earlier mechanisms that I spoke about require a, a special mandate to be created. What is missing is a standing uh, uh, instrument uh, to allow investigations to be carried out internationally. And what will that instrument look like, if you may ask your opinion? Well, uh, uh, Anyas Kalamar, uh, in her then capacity as Special Rapporteur for Summary Executions, uh, had recommended, after her investigation of the killing of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, had recommended an international instrument. And last year, on this particular day, she and I issued a joint public statement in which uh, we actually called for a standing independent investigatory commission to be set up by the United Nations to investigate uh, killings of journalists or attacks on journalists using, where relevant, resources uh, from within the UN system, such as the special uh, rapporteurs or the treaty bodies, as well as other uh, possibilities, other uh, experts from outside the UN system to support national investigation where national uh, authorities may be willing to investigate but are unable to do so for lack of capacity. But this body should also be able to collect information. This in, in, uh, independent investigatory body should also be able to collect information uh, of its own accord. It sh should be able to identify justice pathways. There uh, may be different, you know, from a case to case basis, there may be other opportunities and the commission should be able to collect that information and then be able to pass that information on to a uh, reliable authoritative entity and can work at, national, uh, at international level with other actors to support measures to fight Im impunity. So, what we are talking about is a standing commission dedicated to this very difficult uh, issue. We had also asked, requested uh, a task force perhaps to be set up, a task for force of experts on whom existing mechanisms like mine could call for support. Uh, we recognize that setting up an independent investigatory mechanism may be complicated, will take time, but in the meantime, a task force could be set up outside the UN system, perhaps. It doesn't really matter where it is, but with experts, forensic experts, investigative experts, that those who have existing mandates um, can, can call upon. So these are two 
options. They do not exclude each other. In fact, they can live side by side very well. And my last question, um, Ms. Khan, something that we haven't talked today, but I think as, as a rapporteur from the United Nations, it's, it's important for us, for the tribunal, to hear from you. What is that in terms of prevention when it comes to these crimes? We are, particularly lawyers, very keen with to react, but not so good at preventing. Um, so have you done any work in that spectrum? <laughs> Uh, I think this is an extremely important point because we do not want to be in a position to have to investigate killings. We want to be in a position of preventing uh, that kind of uh, severe um, attack on, on journalists. And prevention must start with creating a conducive environment in which journalists can work without threat or fear. Uh, and there, let me mention to you uh, last two weeks ago, uh, the special, myself, as well as the special rapporteurs of the OAS, the OAU, and the OSCE jointly launched a declaration in which we called upon politicians and political parties and senior state officials to refrain from attacking the integrity of media or of journalists publicly, because that reduces um, people's trust what we are talking here, on the one hand, is the increased uh, killings, and on the other hand, a lowering of public trust in the media. A toxic environment is being created. The first uh, element to address in terms of protection is to deal with that environment. Secondly, there can be concrete measures taken to monitor the situation and to create hotlines, for example, uh, when threats are, uh, are being made that journalists can turn to and seek help. And we know that in most cases of the killings, journalists did try to seek help, uh, but the state authorities either were unable or refused to provide that protection. So there are some concrete uh, uh, measures uh, to prevent and uh, some broader uh, measures to prevent. I would also, th I also think that although we have talked about tribunals and investigations of killings, there is another measure that states might wish to consider, and that is uh, putting uh, sanctions, uh, using sanctions, individualized targeted sanctions against those who are seeking to block uh, investigations or who persist in uh, uh, attacking uh, journalists. So these are some uh, uh, measures. I mean, there are a uh, number of protection measures that, that have been taken, and it is important to also examine what works and what does not work. These are very context-specific issues. Let me mention an important measure uh, that could help uh, not necessarily uh, um, to, to, uh, for journalists to continue in the way they are, but at least to save them in difficult situations. And that is the use of uh, special visas and special means to evacuate journalists. This uh, has been used most recently in the Afghanistan situation. And of course, uh, there are many other situations um, where it could be done. It exists, it needs to be known better, it needs to be expanded and applied uh, properly. Thank you very much, Irene, for your contribution.